Well, our final speaker before the panel, which will come after the break, is Robert Moore. And in the last few years, as you undoubtedly know, Bob has made quite a mark in the field by devoting his considerable energy and intellect to the exploration and the articulation of the nature and dynamics of the male psyche. The fruits of those efforts have been realized in several best-selling books. Here's the list. King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, Rediscovering the Archetypes of the Mature Masculine, The King Within, The Warrior Within is the most recent. I think The Lover is coming out fairly soon to be followed by The Magician. So you have the whole foursome, and then you have each one dealt with separately. Bob, you probably also know, has many audio tape lectures and classes on many subjects. And the ones that concern men really try to offer a mature and responsible alternative path in place of the now thankfully decaying patriarchal sensibility. I think it's important to underline the words mature and responsible here because they describe the core of what really drives Bob's efforts and inspires his creativity. While it's true that Robert Moore is concerned with men and their efforts to find themselves, his real driving passion encompasses and supersedes the so-called men's movement. His real consuming concern, in my opinion, is the future of the human species and the planet that supports us. This is what I think fuels his attention to men, because unless men achieve a balanced maturity and a sense of responsibility, we're in deep trouble. It is this same passion and concern which inspires what I think he will offer us this afternoon, and I'm delighted that he will do that. Would you please welcome Robert Moore. Well, I can't tell you what uh, pleasure I take in being a part of this event, not the least of which is the celebration of this new home for the C.T. Jung Institute of Chicago. And I just want to say a special word of appreciation to Carl Plockman, uh, president of our board of uh, trustees, and all of the trustees who have worked so hard to make this a reality. And also a word of thanks to Peter Mudd, who tries to keep us all honest in our relationships with each other in spite of our protestations and attempts to do otherwise. It's, uh, it, it, we're in, greatly indebted to Peter in so many ways, more than we can articulate. But it's a very personal thing today. I want to say uh, what a joy it is uh, to uh, be here with June Singer, who has continued her support of this institution. But uh, June was one of my first Jungian analysts, and it's a joy to, uh, to be here with her in a different capacity this time. <laughs> uh, of course, there are a lot of us that could say that today, right? A lot of us are former analysts of June. But that's a pleasure. But it's also uh, it's also a joy to to be with uh, people who are leading theoreticians uh, in Jungian psychology, such as Murray Stein in this program. And uh, Robert Siegel takes me back to a previous incarnation in my life. Robert and I worked together a great deal in the uh, American Academy of Religion uh, uh, when I was working with the Religion and Social Sciences section of the AAR. And I've long been an admirer of his tremendously competent work in religious studies and in theoretical interpretations of religion and the human sciences. So this is exciting for me. And... uh, and uh, it also gives me an opportunity to do a little retrospective uh, on this topic. Believe it or not, the thing that led me into the studies that I've been working on for the last couple of decades and longer uh, was an interest in the psychology of esoteric religion. 
And uh, what I wanted to do was to, uh, to take us to a little reflection about the psychological geography of esoteric religion, uh, which of course includes the Gnostic tradition, but uh, is a wider human tactic for survival. And I would like to begin by talking a little bit about some of my early researches into this, which are soon hopefully going to be published in a book called The Magician and the Analyst, Ritual, Sacred Space, and Psychotherapy. should come out in 93. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to do that. I'd like to, to talk about my field work, which led me into the psychological geography of, of the inner space of esoteric religion. And then I would like to, to share with you some, some psychological reflections on way, different ways people have tried to understand this esoteric inner geography, uh, Gnostic world, one might say. And then I would like us to, to look at some sociological perspectives on this, all in an effort to connect us with our own present, uh, that this may not be simply a, an antiquarian effort on our parts. June started us off with the contemporary issues uh, that this topic uh, engages us in. And I would like to, uh, to use these reflections to get us into uh, the struggle that we are presently engaged in. In short, I want us to be able to tie what we're talking about here today to the kind of event such as the, the event of the bombing of the World Trade Center uh, in New York City yesterday, uh, uh, such as the Serbian-Bosnian uh, Holocaust that's going on now such as the Mideastern struggle, uh, such as the continued racism we're, f we're facing now, and such as the, the powerful continuing reality of sexism. Uh, in so many. Because I think there are some close internal ties between our topic uh, and those uh, current events. And so if you will bear with me, I will jump in and try to get us uh, over this geography uh, with some... Uh, uh, speed. It was back in the early 1970s that I first got interested in the psychology of occult experience. And at that time, I was doing psychotherapy with a lot of young people who were involved in one and the other esoteric religions. One might say that in those days I was a an anti-cultist. That is, I was convinced that uh, these different religious groups that these young people were involved in were making them crazy. And so I saw as my research task, you know, very obje objective and scientific, right? Uh, to go out here and find out why these religions were choosing to make these young people so crazy. And so I began at that time, back in the early 1970s, to, to do uh, ethnographic field research. And I began to travel all over the United States and do focused interviewing with uh, young people and people of other ages in, in different occult traditions. Some of them, frankly, considered themselves Gnostics, and would use the word. Uh, others were participants in other traditions that would be considered by us, if we looked at it comparatively speaking, Gnostic traditions of Islam, like Sufism, uh, Gnostic traditions of, uh, of uh, different uh, schools of Western magic, uh, different schools of Buddhist uh, uh, esoteric teaching. And before long, I had had thousands of hours of focused interviewing with people of different ages uh, participating in these groups. Now, at that time, I had no sense about any archetype of initiation to speak of. I had heard a little bit about it through Joseph Henderson and other persons. And I had studied with Iliadi, Merchie Iliadi, at the University of Chicago, so I knew a little something about uh, sacred space, very little about it. Uh, and I had... Uh, 
done some studies of, uh, uh, some very, very limited studies of ritual. Uh, but <clears throat> I had very little understanding about the way in which these different things tie together in uh, the practice of esoteric religion. And gradually I began to, to get a sense that the geography of, of the world that, that these persons occupy had very interesting kinds of uh, common elements. And that as you interviewed different persons, you found that they, they were members of different subgroups that could be delineated within uh, uh, esoteric religious practice. Now, of course, the one that, that you and I hear of so often, in fact, it's become the uh, title page of some journals, uh, uh, is the quester. Uh, I began to note that there were many of these young persons who were out there looking for the truth. And their quest had taken them through religion after religion after religion. They were sort of in the smorgasbord of American religions. And uh, they, some of the persons that I talked to had been through 20 different uh, uh, religious groups looking for it, right? Looking for it. And um, many of these young persons, one of the things we learn in sociological studies of this kind of uh, esoteric participation is that many of these persons uh, will do this for about three years. In fact, let me suggest the book uh, uh, by Saul Levine called Radical Departures, which was a sociological study of this sort of phenomena, which showed people going in and out of esoteric religious groups. The next category that you could discern in each of these groups was the category of that we can call a, and we often call together the true initiate the the person that believes that they have now been introduced into and developed an understanding of the particular esoteric geography of that religion and uh, uh, they're a person that has has that is now privy to the truth and uh, in this status, which is what we have to think of it as, in this new status, they have an, a tremendously enhanced sense of self and significance and meaning of their lives. For example, if you are a lower middle class person uh, working in some very uh, uh, nondescript, uh, low paying job, if one has become an initiate in one of the esoteric traditions that uh, I studied, one now has a tremendously increased sense of significance and selfhood and meaning in life. Uh, so that was a larger uh, uh, group in terms of the ongoing membership of these esoteric religions. Much smaller in number and much harder to get to to interview and study were what we could call the adept or what many traditions call the master. And that is a person who had spent a great deal of time in studying the particular esoteric tradition. And that person takes on the role, as we say today, of ritual elder in that tradition and as a gatekeeper of the mysteries. Uh, they are uh, usually uh, healers of some uh, in various uh, esoteric traditions. And uh, it was a stunning thing for me to, to, be pre to be finally invited to be present with some of these esoteric adepts uh, as they did healing rituals with uh, paranoid schizophrenics. Uh, I might add very large paranoid schizophrenics and uh, it was a it was a a kind of experience that uh, I had never expected to be present in now as I be continued to study this I was fascinated by the role of and this is going to tie my reflections together this afternoon the role of the human quest for significance, a sense of significance and meaning in the participation in these esoteric traditions. 
and in the attractiveness of this esoteric geography. And um, as I began to look, I noted that other persons studying these uh, phenomena from the point of view of sociology had developed elaborate systems of uh, looking at participation in esoteric traditions as uh, what is known in sociology as uh, uh, status enhancement. And so it began to be clear to me that there was a very sophisticated approach to actually dealing with the human hunger for significance in these traditions. And as we began to look at this and compare this to other perspectives from the psychology of religion and the sociology of religion, this has been a theme in many interpretations of religion uh, for a long time. So uh, the issue of significance and meaning uh, and finding a place, a significant place in a cosmos, in a world, uh, was key. And there were a lot of people agreeing on this. And uh, so the question was not, and is for us today, is not whether or not the issue of significance is central here in our looking at Gnosticism. The human desire for, indeed longing for, indeed necessity for a sense of significance. This is central. One of the things we need to do this afternoon is to work together and struggle together on trying to understand how we feel about this. What are we to think of this? Is there something wrong with this? Uh, why is this longing for significance being taken so often into uh, religious experiences in general and today into esoteric religions in particular, and certainly, as June has pointed out to us, the, the increasing burgeoning interest in Gnosticism uh, is related to this. Now, for a few moments, let me just uh, summarize quickly some of my own reflections about this, because I've been studying this for a time now. I have been fascinated with the different attitudes among psychologists on this issue of... Uh, the nature and role of this human uh, quest for a sense of meaning and significance through uh, esoteric practices. Of course, we're all familiar with classical Freudian perspectives on religion in general and the human interest in religion in general. Uh, it's a very pathologizing perspective. Uh, it... Uh, looks upon religious practice in general and certainly esoteric religious practice as a, a, as a form of neurotic, uh, uh, rather delusion, obsessional and delusional kinds of uh, preoccupations, uh, usually defensive in nature. Uh, and so uh, uh, we don't really look to classical Freudianism for much uh, in the way of an interpretation of the positive role that religious experience in general or spirituality uh, plays in the human psyche. You know, I was at a recent American Academy of Religion meeting and uh, one of our old friends is a very smart Freudian psychoanalyst. And I had gotten my hopes up that the Freudians had learned something about religion in recent years. Uh, but in listening to my very smart Freudian psychoanalyst friend, I was disappointed to learn that they were still doing the same pathologizing and reductional reduction of, uh, of religious experience and ritual experience that they've been doing a long time. Uh, so we don't, we don't look to the classical tradition of Freudian psychoanalysis for very much understanding about any positive roles, certainly, of uh, esoteric uh, practices uh, uh, in, uh, in human life. Adlerian tradition uh, focuses on uh, something of great significance for us here. The idea that all human beings are working very hard to overcome a sense of inferiority and a sense of a lack of meaning in the world. And that this is universal. And that in the human psyche there is the formation while the Adlerians don't say in the unconscious, they don't like to talk about it that way. They say there are unconscious 
preoccupations with superiority. And so an Adlerian psychoanalyst will always be looking for the unconscious neurotic preoccupation with superiority that underlies all the symptoms. And so, in other words, they say behind every inferiority complex, right, there is a superiority complex. But they are good existentialist psychologists in the sense that they do point out that in religion, as in so many other areas of life, and they would, if you were to talk to Bernard Schulman here of the uh, Adler Institute of Chicago, and you would talk to him about uh, the role of esoteric uh, religion, he would talk about it as a way in which human beings uh, seek to find some sense uh, of, of significance of an, of an opportunity to overcome a felt sense of inferiority. Still, the Adlerians, uh, while they are less pathologizing than the Freudians about this, the assumption is really this. You have a, a desire to be one of the elect. You have a desire to participate in this esoteric knowledge. Well, it's understandable but that's a continuation of your rather pampered desire to be extraordinary. And when you really become healed through working with me, your Adlerian analyst, you will accept being ordinary, right? So in other words... <clears throat> Any kind of participation in something that is, that is to make you feel a part of a special elect, a special initiated group, is still looked upon as somewhat neurotic and pathological and, and uh, desirous of superiority. Now, some of that feeling uh, continues on in... in a Jungian uh, interpretation of this kind of phenomena. Though again, it's, it's true, I think, that Jungian interpretations of religion are on the whole less pathologizing of religion than any other that you're going to find. In Jungian terms, uh, one when one looks at this sort of, uh, of interest in esoteric religion, one clearly, quickly sees, well, this is a manifestation of the encounter of the ego with the archetypal self. And all of this interest in initiation and all of this interest in participation in the special gnosis, the special knowledge, the special community, finding the center, the fount of truth, of truth finding the, the door back to the uh, beloved community, that that is a manifestation of the archetypal self. And certainly, uh, you've been hearing uh, reflections about Jung's view and reasons for Jung's interest in Gnosticism, and in our discussion, we'll be hearing a lot more uh, about that. Now, some Jungians would look at esoteric practice and the thing that they would come to quickly would be saying, aha, this is inflation. That is to say, there are many uh, who would look at participation in esoteric traditions, Gnosticism and others, and the sense of specialness claimed uh, in those traditions, and they would say, well, you know, you've always got your mana personalities, You've got your persons that think they are the guru, uh, and uh, they present themselves. They would look at uh, these, these people that consider themselves occult adepts or ritual masters, and they would say, mm-hmm, uh, this person has lost the boundary between their ego and their self, and they're identifying with the wise man within or the wise woman within, and uh, they're inflated, and uh, they need to be uh, helped to get that, that connection between the ego and the self more clear, but more differentiated. Uh, 
And so while some Jungian interpretations would would be less pathologizing than Freudian or Adlerian perspectives, there are many Jungians today who, when they see any numinosity present in a personality, they too are tempted to say, aha, inflation, and uh, distance from that and want to say this is, uh, this is contagion by archetypal materials. In recent years, we have seen a new context become much more clear for this discussion. For many years in psychoanalysis, there was not a very great emphasis on the difference between pathological narcissism and healthy narcissism. And in recent years, uh, since the work of Heinz Kohut uh, and self-psychology, uh, we have seen a lot more burgeoning interest uh, in psychoanalysis uh, in general uh, with regard to looking freshly at narcissism, at the claim for specialness, at what we here called in self-psychology uh, at grandiose exhibitionistic libido. We'll get into that, I hope, more in our discussion. Uh, I want to express my appreciation to Margaret Shanahan, my partner, for teaching me a lot of this self-psychology in relationship to Jung's work. Uh, I have found the perspectives of self-psychology to be extremely helpful in rethinking Jungian thought on the idea of inflation and the relationship between the ego and the self. And that has led me into the development of my own work. I mean, I have been heavily influenced now by uh, these later uh, psychoanalytic self-psychological perspectives in the formation of my own work. One of the important things to realize that post Kohut, there is much less pathologizing of the human desire to be special. In fact, from the point of view of psychoanalytic self-psychology, if you are not admitting to yourself your desire to be special and recognized, then you are really in a defense against your longings for being seen and recognized. Uh, the, the understanding in psychoanalytic self-psychology is that we all have great desires to be seen and recognized and to be special and to have large significance. And uh, in Kohut's tradition, those that uh, work out of his tradition, uh, there is a tremendous attempt both theoretically and clinically to move beyond the pathologizing of the longing to be seen and to be celebrated. Uh, that is to say, to get to the point where we can admit to our desire to be precious to significant others and to our desire to be seen and celebrated by our community as having special value and significant meaning, not just for our private life, but for our work. Now, this has led me to believe in my own work on the self from a Jungian point of view, <clears throat> uh, and this is in the light of some of the discussions you've heard earlier, uh, I think that Jungian psychology in recent years has moved heavily toward ego psychology. Uh, that is to say there has been far less uh, emphasis on uh, the importance of understanding the archetypal self and its role in a transformed uh, human life, both personal and social. And my work, which I will not get into here and do my little diagrams and on the diamond body and all that sort of thing, uh, but I will give you a commercial look at the appendix to The King Within, uh, where you'll see uh, some of my own elaborations of Jungian theory uh, influenced through uh, self-psychology. 
uh, and related to Gnostic traditions in that. Uh, <clears throat> in short, uh, I believe that the direction Jungian psychology needs to take on these issues is to understand that there are reasons this numinosity is in the psyche. It is not merely a source of pathology. That this numinosity in the psychology is, as the cohesions have pointed out, but even more than they have seen, this is the source of vigor and zest in life. This is the source of our creativity. This is the source of our sense of possibility. Uh, when we speak of the Gnostic vision of the Anthropos and the Gnostic vision of the Pleroma, uh, I think if we look at, you know, look at this material through Jungian eyes informed by the best in recent psychoanalytic psychology, we begin <clears throat> to look at an enormous challenge to us to see the way in which shame still dominates human life and human culture. These neat little comparisons between guilt cultures and shame cultures, what we need to face is that all of our cultures are shame cultures. And that uh, in cultures which are dominated by exoteric traditions, uh, Christianity included, uh, uh, you can be forgiven anything except wanting to be admired and recognized and to be special. And that's why we save the worst approbation in Christian tradition for pride, uh, hubris, etc. So, uh, in my work, I have attempted to, to elaborate the ways in which the great self within, uh, as the Gnostic vision of Anthropos shows, uh, offers us a diamond body, a numinous, libidinally loaded blueprint for the fullness of human being, and that in contrast to some uh, compulsively introverted Jungians, it also offers us the ground for a vision of a transformed and renewed uh, human community. And uh, that if one looks carefully at the powers uh, that exist within the human self, uh, that one can see uh, large uh, theoretical, uh, psychological reasons for looking at these Gnostic traditions, I think, as, as Jung did in some ways, <clears throat> as offering clues to these deep structures and some of the many human possibilities that lie in the blueprint for the formation of the human self. Now, lest you think that we Jungians, or at least some of us Jungians, are the only ones that talk that way, Margaret and I are fond of going to self-psychology conferences in New York. Gives us an excuse to go to New York to some plays. Recently, we heard some of the cutting-edge self-psychologists talking about how they have decided now that there is indeed an impersonal blueprint for the formation of the human self resident in the psyche prior to personal experiences. Margaret and I could hardly contain ourselves at the fact that these folks had finally discovered Jung and did not know it. Now, let me turn now. I, I, I don't want to, many of you have, have heard me talk about the diamond body so much that you're hoping I'm not going to talk about that here today, and I'm not. I'm going to turn us now to, to, to a challenge for us to look at the way in which, which the new psychology of narcissism and the new less pathologizing, indeed affirming, uh, attitude toward the importance of blessing grandiose exhibitionistic energies in the self and helping the self to integrate these into life. How these relate to some traditions in other schools of thought that relate to our concerns today. And let me just briefly, I've got enough time to briefly run through some of these. 
First, let me go back to mentioning again Merch Iliadi's work. I think it's time for us Jungians to realize that we have not begun to plumb the importance of Merch Iliadi's work for Jungian psychology. Why? Because if you understand the, the significance of Jungian psychology, one must turn again away from the movement toward ego psychology that we've had in recent years or toward a sort of a throwing out the self. We have to turn back to, uh, to the issue of human luminosity as the source and ground of healing. And it is in Iliadi's work, in his Phenomenology of the Sacred, that we get the largest compendium of, of clarity about human expense, experiences of the numinous. And to look at Iliadi's understanding of the, the long-term struggle of human beings to connect with numinosity for regeneration and healing and renovation of the world in a new way. In other words, <clears throat> if you look at this through a contemporary Jungian point of view that is not uh, into some sort of fantasy of being post-Jungian, uh, if you look at this through a contemporary Jungian point of view and you look at the grounding of healing in numinosity and you begin to look at what Iliadi describes human wisdom through the centuries as, then you see that humans have struggled to connect with numinosity, the, the sense of divine power, divine presence, without being destroyed by it. And this should be seen as a backdrop for all of our discussions today. Because at the heart here is, what is our relationship to this sense of the divine, the numinous, the sacred to be? And how, what has it got to do with healing? Is this merely regressive, archaic, primitive? Or is there something uh, for us in our present about this? Is Iliadi merely an antiquarian? You know, a lot of very smart people have dismissed his work today. That shows to me that you can, you know, with being smart and 75 cents, you can get a cup of coffee. That is to say, a lot of smart people that know things that, uh, that go real fast and miss significant issues. So I think we have to look at Iliadi's work on the phenomenology of the sacred and look at his pointing out the human preoccupation with connection with numinosity for healing and the danger of that. I want to call, us, call our attention to the way in which this relates to the greatest sociologist, I believe, the greatest sociologist of religion of all time, Max Weber. You've all heard of Weber's studies of charismatic leadership and of the routinization of charisma. <clears throat> if you look at Weber's work on charismatic leadership from the point of view of contemporary Jungian thought, you will see the direct relationship between the human experience of the sacred and what Weber talks about as charisma and what June was talking about yesterday as these divine sparks. We're talking about a fundamental human experience of numinosity that comes into the human social world, as Weber pointed out, and immediately the exoteric leaders begin to try to routinize it and control it. There are many persons today who point out that the history of religion is an attempt to domesticate the divine. This is one of the things that led Carl Jung to be extremely suspicious of exoteric religious forms. Uh, here again, <clears throat> we see the human ambivalence toward these divine sparks, this numinosity, this sense of divine, grounded sense of significance. The person that in recent years did the most interesting work on sociological perspectives on this, I believe to be the sociologist Peter Berger, whose study of the becoming of modern culture in books like The Sacred Canopy and The Homeless Mind have treated 
the increasing difficulties human beings on this planet have with connection with numinosity. That is, he points out that in the uh, pre-modern world, human beings found their ways to connect with numinosity, not just among the Gnostics, but certainly there, and to relate to it in ways that they felt would help them renovate, rejuvenate, regenerate, and be healed. People like Peter Homans today, another, Jung, uh, another person that writes about Jung from a non-Jungian point of view, has followed up in this tradition. And in a very significant and interesting book, one called The Ability to Mourn, uh, Homans presents the point of view that is a challenge to us today. That is, <clears throat> his assumption is that the fall into modernity with regard to these issues of the human relation to numinosity is a once and for all done deal. That is to say, what human beings in our time have to do is to realize that the time when we could connect with these divine sparks, when we could have any sense of participation in a special place, is over. And the appropriate response to that is simply doing your grief work. That is learning to mourn. The Freudian, this is a replay of the Freudian renunciation. Renunciation. Give it up. It was all an infantile fantasy anyway. All that stuff about your being special. See? Now, <clears throat> I think we need to think today about the way in which Gnosticism in traditional culture and today is a different alternative to this kind of issue. Now, in, in pre-modern culture, uh, the Gnostics were not by any means alone in their participation in esoteric traditions. That is, the, 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 the people we know as Gnostics were not the only people who were adopting a Gnostic uh, uh, approach to these experiences of the numinous in the human self. The things that you've heard June Singer talk about and that she writes about uh, and uh, lectures about widely about contemporary Gnosticism, <clears throat> we must be clear, provides a very different attitude toward the possibilities for human beings in the participation in a sense of numinosity, of specialness, of significance of the self in relationship to the world. Uh, in the Gnostic alternative, we need to think about these as attempts to preserve a sense of human significance. Gnosticism as an alternative, uh, uh, we've not heard that much about yet, but we're beginning to hear more about it. It is an attempt to say once again that you can turn within. There is a source within. There is a numinous center within that in this numinosity within there are significant understandings, significant energies, significant resources for wholeness, for revitalized, regenerated living. Now, contemporary human beings have not turned much to Gnosticism in this form. What have we turned to? If the self-psychologists are right, and I believe they are, there's no such thing as a human being that's not seeking to pres preserve a sense of significance. How do contemporary human beings in our world seek to preserve their sense of worth, preciousness, specialness, a reason for living, a sense of meaning? Well, you think about some... and bring them in later, I've got a few to suggest. <clears throat> a recent book by Jared Diamond has come out called The Third Chimpanzee. It's a natural history of our species. 
summarizing some of the most recent data that we have with regard to our evolution as a species. One of the disturbing things he points out <clears throat> about our species is our tendency toward malignant tribalism, which takes the form of genocide. <clears throat> In other words, one extremely popular method for preserving a sense of significance is in enhancing one's own sense of one's tribe. In this way, my tribe is the locus of numinous energy, sense of specialness and worth. It can be Christian, it can be Muslim, it can be Jewish, uh, it can be the uh, Crips, it can be the Bloods, uh, but your, my tribe is the source of numinosity and the ground of numinosity and the container of numinosity, and it enables me to maintain my sense of selfhood in face of the insults of human life. And it gives me a license to do what I will with those who are not in my tribe. And one of the shocking things that Jared Diamond has pointed out is the incredible regularity with which our species is engaged in genocide. This is not something that most of us are widely aware of. But in that book, he's got a chart with the dates and places where our species is engaged in genocide. It's happening today in, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, and, uh, and it is happening... Uh, uh, in our cities today, as in our culture, we attempt to kill off all the young black males or imprison them. At a conference at Chicago Theological Seminary last Saturday, it was reported that by the year 2000, if current trends continue, 70% of all the young black males in our nation will be either in prison or addicted. Seventy percent. And as one gentleman pointed out to me this morning at the Chicago Men's Conference, Robert, <clears throat> you mean the ones that are still alive? I said, yes, the ones that are still alive. So that gets us to another favorite human tactic for the preservation of a sense of specialness and numinosity in the self. And that's racism. Getting more popular all the time on the planet. Uh, since the uh, events with Rodney King in California not long ago, uh, we've been set back in race relations uh, uh, probably 30 years at least in the United States. Uh, but we're not the only persons that uh, use this method of racism for a sense of preservation of our sense of specialness and, 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 uh, and a sense of superiority. Uh, it's a very widespread thing throughout the world. <clears throat> Add to that classism as a means. Very popular in the United States, especially among the professional classes. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in the, in, in, uh, for example, in Chicago, you can, either, you can either have a sense of specialness by choosing your suburb, right? That helps one maintain one's sense of self. Or one can choose one's professional group or one's community, which gives one a sense of other kinds of superiority. In Hyde Park, nobody brags about the real estate. Uh, they just brag about the intellect. Got to be smart to be in Hyde Park, you know. So there are all sorts of these little enclaves. What you think about them as little vessels to carry the sense of specialness or superiority. And we need to, to realize that when we're speaking of, of this landscape that we've opened up in this conference, we're talking about various human strategies to preserve a sense of selfhood in the face of the insults of history and time. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not note here that another extremely popular one in our culture is sexism. And uh, I think it... No accident that 
in the uh, in in our history that if a woman happens to be smart and beautiful, then she is very likely to be demonized by her culture and read not as the preferred religious uh, model, but as a representative of some evil tradition uh, of the esoteric. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to understand that, that a lot of the phenomena we see in sexism is not merely something just related to gender. It's related to narcissistic supplies. It's related to the people's struggle to maintain a sense of selfhood in the face of narcissistic insults and injuries. And therefore, the more that one gender feels weak and disempowered, the more rage responses we have and the more hatred we have between the genders. So uh, uh, we, we're, we struggle with that stuff. And if you look at Homan, Homan's argument, we're likely to be struggling with it a long time. If you believe Homans is right, that there are no positive answers to this loss of a sense of numinosity. Now, I think we have to face up to the enormous crisis that we face in this world now on these issues. The more we study human development, the more we are aware of the enormity of the care and nurture, the enormity of the focused mirroring that it requires to help a child affirm a healthy, vibrant, vigorous sense of self, male or female. And if we take that and hold that in one hand, the, the more that we learn about the energy it takes, think about the mentoring you needed versus the mentoring you got. Compare those two things. And then we look at the population dynamics that are being widely denied now. We're not doing very well nurturing the humans we have. And we are planning to double the human population in a very short time with the uh, decline in resources available. We are looking at a situation in which the human desire for significance and a sense of meaning is going to be flooded by an increasing diminution of resources unless we have a spiritual revolution in this world. And so in the light of those things, and we could go on, but in the light of those things, we need to come back to look <clears throat> at what June has presented and others have talked about here <clears throat> about Gnosticism and esoteric uh, religious practices uh, as one strategy human beings are engaging in to try to find ways to maintain selfhood in the face uh, of history and of struggle and of uh, a lot of the anomy and meaninglessness of contemporary life. Now, one of the questions we should address is this. You know, the Gnostics and Gnostic strategies to maintain significance are often criticized, widely criticized, as being nihilistic retreats from the world. Now, in self-psychology, we would, we would say what they're talking about there is what is known as a grandiose retreat. That is, I come into the world, and I know that I deserve more recognition, more appreciation, and more celebration by my community, and I do not get it. And therefore, I retreat into an enclave where I can seek to restore my narcissistic equilibrium. Now, there are many people that would have us believe that <clears throat> Gnosticism and Gnostic religious practice, uh, uh, esoteric religious practice in general, are nihilistic, grandiose retreats. Now, one of the things we need to address today, do you think that's true? Does that have to be true? Is that true? Does that have to be true? Is it sometimes true? Uh, another point of view, however, would be this. Is it possible that esoteric religious practices are a way in which human beings 
are seeking to find a sanctuary for the self, a zone of hospitality for a sense of significant selfhood, a place from which they can find an empowering spiritual center that is connected with a sense of the numinous, of the sacred, from which they might move toward significant engagement with the world uh, in transformative action. Now, let me suggest that I have seen people in grandiose retreats, not just esoteric religionists. A lot of us major in those. But I have also seen esoteric religious practitioners who use their practice of an esoteric tradition as a sanctuary, as a base for refueling of their self and their sense of worth and significance and preciousness and meaning, and from which they have gone into significant work in the world in transformative action. Now, let me. I, I could, if I had time, I don't have time, but if I had time, I could give you a number of examples of this, one of which I happen to know a number of esoteric Buddhists here in our city who are not satisfied merely to retreat into their gnosis as initiated Buddhists, but they are taking their time and money and energy and they're going into the prisons around here. And they are spending time with prisoners that uh, many in exoteric religion don't have any time for. And they're teaching them meditation. They're teaching them what we might call Gnostic means of achieving some sense of self-worth and integrity. Uh, means which repair what our society did not provide for them and what their families did not provide for them. <clears throat> so this, I see, is a contemporary issue that we have to face in this conference today. That is to say, is Peter Holman's right when he says, well, the real realistic, mature way here is just grieve. You know, It was nice when you were infantile to think of yourself as significant and having a significant mission in the world. But now that we've become mature, we put that stuff away and we become University of Chicago professors. See. Or is it truly possible, uh, following uh, some of Jung's insights, that we human beings as a species, or the spe that we are the species of primate, which have within our DNA potentials for carrying and embodying uh, a sense of significance uh, and celebration which will enable us to vigorously engage uh, the problems of our species and our fellow species on this planet. Now that is a question and uh, people are all over the place on that. Uh, my position uh, it's fairly straightforward for this, and uh, uh, and uh, I don't apologize for it. Uh, in a series of lectures I gave recently, I spoke about the great self in mythology and psychology. I believe <clears throat> that we are a primate that has hardwired in the DNA an experience of numinosity, and uh, that it is a part of our maturation process to connect with that. And that until we have connected with our sense of meaning and specialness, uh, we haven't really matured as a personality. So I think my, it's my personal view that we have to turn a lot of these psychologies on their heads. Uh, a, a, a diminution of the human personality, a dwarfing of the human soul is not maturation of that soul. And I think this is where we reconnect with the kind of thing that June was leading us in reflection upon yesterday. The Gnostics had a sense that if you turn within, 
there is a an incredible source not only for energy not only for a sense of a divine spark but there is significant knowledge about our potential as a species in there and that turning to that and carefully protecting ourselves from the envious shaming of those who have not dealt with their own grandiosity, uh, we can turn within and find sources for the kind of energy and the kind of vision and the kind of heroic commitment that it will take if we as a species are going to survive. Now, that's my position, and uh, so uh, in short, I would say, while I am very clear that in our vulnerability as individuals who have had somewhat less than perfect parenting, right, that we do have vulnerabilities in ourselves, in our narcissistic equilibrium, that when we run into the to the disappointments of life, send us into grandiose retreats. They may be religious, they may be alcohol, they may be travel, whatever. Certainly that is true. But I am in agreement with the spirit of what June was talking about, that the Gnostic tradition witnesses to an inner reality an inner geography that is not simply an expression of a cult. That there is an inner cosmology that comes with us uh, in the two million year old evolution of what we are as a species that can enable us to envision a new possibility uh, for our species and for this planet. Thank you very much. understand I have a few minutes in which I can uh, respond to questions before we get into our free-for-all later. Yes. Having read the not how many papers, uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on some of the more bizarre, if you will, uh, explanations of how we came to be. Mm-hmm. All these different, I mean, just almost incomprehensible ways of explaining creation. <laughs> and why do you think they were made in that, to me, in a bizarre manner? Yeah. Well, I do a lot of comparative study of mythic traditions. And if you get into to deep study of any particular mythical tradition, you will, you will get into uh, extremely elaborated and seemingly fantastic uh, mythic accounts of creation and uh, uh, human origins and the origins of the conditions of the planet and so forth. So part of that is the human mythic imagination. When you touch this great self within you, when you get past your defenses, some of you in the room have uh, either from drugs or from meditation or from midlife crisis or from a hospitalization, uh, some of you have, have touched these grandiose, exhibitionistic, numinous energies in the deep self. And as William James said, once you touch these things, uh, your capacity to disbelieve them is overwhelmed. There is an amazing inner world in there. And that is, uh, in spite of our tendency to drug our psychotic persons into insensibility today so that we don't have to pay attention to their inner worlds, uh, still those that work with persons in 
uh, acute uh, paranoid schizophrenic episodes uh, see into these inner worlds every day in their practice. Uh, there are really worlds upon worlds in there, in different places in the human soul. Now, your question, I assume, has something to do with what is the ontological status of all of that? That is, is there any truth in that? Well, here again, now we're going to shift gears from psychology because psychologists don't talk about that. See, When you start talking about that, you've become at least a philosopher and uh, very likely a theologian, a metaphysician. Now, uh, when I do metaphysics and philosophy, I am a Whiteheadian following Alfred North Whitehead's work. If you study Alfred North Whitehead's work, uh, it is amazing the kind of possibilities for uh, uh, worlds that really exist uh, in, in reality. That is to say, this is only one, according to Whitehead, this is where we live, is only one cosmic epoch. And in terms of Whitehead, there are countless, like there are countless galaxies, there are countless cosmic epochs that operate according to different laws. And this is a rational metaphysical system, probably the single greatest metaphysical philosophical system of our time. So I'm the last person to say that some of those Gnostic insights may not be telling us real things about a world in some cosmic epoch that really exists. And, of course, Whitehead believed that a part of our connection from within that each entity, each of us beings, is directly connected with all other beings in all the cosmic epochs. Directly connected, not theoretically connected. In other words, Whitehead's thought is very similar to a lot of the new physics. And so uh, I think it would be intellectually really kind of silly to say that there may not be some actual knowledge from those visions. Now, sorting that out, uh, that's for everyone to try to go exploring and try to do. Other comments or questions? Yes, Murray. For genocide, it seems to be wired in. What gives you the grounds to be optimistic that uh, there are other resources that can counteract that? Yes. Well, the question is about genocide, about is this wired in? See, I don't think it's genocide in particular that's wired in at all. I think this is related to our territoriality as a species and our sense of boundaries as a species and what I call in my work warrior kinds of instinctualities. And so if you're in, one of the things Diamond does is to show the way in which population pressures among primates, lead to genocide. And what it is is, is is competition over scarce resources and limited land areas. And so uh, rather than saying that genocide is wired in, I think what we see is there has been, uh, our species developed into essentially what we are today a long time ago. And, and yet our information base was very, very limited in those tribal days. We did not have anything like the view of ourselves as an Earth planet, as a home planet, uh, even 50 years ago, that we do now. So my response to that would be that the thing that has changed is not our capacity to process information so much as a biological organism. It is our incredible increase in information uh, and perspectives, uh, as Joseph Campbell pointed out in his Inner Reaches of Outer Space, uh, in terms of the view from space, there's much more capacity for our mind to get a hologram image, holographic image of, oh, so that's us. And so there, the hope I have is based on, uh, as I said to the uh, men at the Chicago Men's Conference today, I think we have to we have to put energy into seeking to make some reality out of the idea of earth women and earth men 
and that that is not simply a pipe dream. That is a must. If that does not start getting energy, uh, then uh, then our chances to, to deal effectively with the challenges we face ecologically and in terms of human rights and so forth uh, are very limited. But I think... Uh, I think there is hope, but uh, see, one of the reasons that I think the Jungian community is very important, uh, and I mean this very, very seriously, the reason I think this institution and your participation in it is important is there are so few groups in the world today that are trying to bridge between religions, between religion and science, uh, between ethnic groups. Uh, Somebody can call us a mongrel psychology, but I, I'd like to say we're an inclusive psychology. We like to uh, we like to include the species. Jungian psychology is one of the very few resources on this planet that is not emphasizing diversity and difference. Rather, it tries to emphasize unity and diversity. So I think that. Uh, that the Jungian community internationally has a burgeoning role in trying to contain our sense of tribalism and to try to help us find ways to, to creatively to have a gnosis that is more adequate to our potential uh, as a species. Yes. Yeah. That is, I mean by that, yes, uh, I mean by that simply what Al Gore is talking about in his... Uh, in his uh, book, Earth in the Balance, uh, and what Eric Erickson was talking about when he was talking about the importance of pseudo-speciation. That is to say, humans must develop a species ethic. That is, we, we must foster species identification first. And when you, when you foster identification with our species, it's not Christian first, then human. Muslim first, then human. Jew first, then human. Hindu first, then human. If we foster, if we develop a species ethic and we suggest to people that their first identification is as earth women or as earth men, that they, that they identify with their species, that we seek to do everything we can and everything we do to foster bonding with our species, not with our simply our tribe. That is a critical issue. Al Gore is totally right on what he says about that. Yes. Well, I want to take off from that. Well, yes. I think we need this ecological uh, identity. And, and by that, I, I, I mean it in a very, very way. And I'd like to introduce that in this uh, discussion, the, uh, the book Growing Young by Ashley Montague, yes. which I consider one of the most important books today. Because he is saying that uh, he is uh, positing the neonate theory of, of uh, evolution. He yeah. says the reason why we are who we are at the cutting edge of evolution, because unlike all other higher creatures, we are childlike adult par excellence. Now that means that the 15 billion year evolutionary story has been oriented for all that time to creating us as a childlike adult. And, that, and to be childlike means to be created. And to be childlike is to be in touch with the numinous, mm -hmm. to be in touch mm -hmm. uh, with the sacred. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, that book is very important. But there's another book that's terribly important, and that's The Universe Story, mm -hmm. uh, uh, written by Thomas Berry, uh, who calls himself a geologian, mm -hmm. a theologian of yeah, the earth. Theologian. And, right. and uh, uh, Brian Swim, yeah. who is a physicist uh, who uh, uh, has a, uh, a Native American uh, uh, background. He's a genius. Both of them are geniuses. And what they've been doing together is for the first time telling us the one story, the new Genesis story, that combines science and religion. Yes. And does it in a magnificent way. And, and, and I, I certainly hope that that's a, a, a no Thank you for that, John. That's yes, that's right. That's right. And, and what the thing we have to think about is... Uh, the difference between tribal spiritualities and a human spirituality, an earth spirituality. Uh, and certainly Thomas Berry is very important. And the only thing I would say is that it's very important for us to get a sense of our species identification. And instead of having tribal initiation as existed for so long, 
or our lack of initiation as is parallel to modern culture. You know, we just think if you get born, you know, suddenly you're, you know, you're an adult. Uh, uh, that we need to think about, uh, we need to think about maturation of of the ape that we are. We're this wonderful primate. We are we are in this ecological system, and that pay, that's what you're getting us to look at. We must claim our speciesood as animals. We are the animals that have an, a gnostic imagination, see, a mythological imagination. We dream large dreams this ape that we are. We dream, we dream large dreams. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Murray. <laughs> he said, it's a species it's not easy to like. I think we're beautiful. I just think we're a little unconscious. No, we're a lot unconscious. And we are messing, here's what they say uh, down home, uh, we're messing in our nest. We're we're messing in our nest. We're we're destroying this we're destroying this environment and we're not going to be able to continue on. One of the other things I'll shut up in a minute. One of the other things that Whitehead says is that you know that every every uh, cosmic epoch is an experiment. And a lot of possible things, a lot of possible things in different cosmic epochs fail. And it's not because, as Whitehead says, it's not because the divine reality doesn't try. It's because uh, the creatures in that epoch do not sufficiently affirm their own co-creative role in that epoch. So, uh, so the verdict is very out. And one of the joys of being a part of this institute and of this community is that I, I love the way in which this community at least tries to address these issues of a greater inclusiveness. And without simply uh, recommending a heavy dose of grief for all of us like Homans does. Uh, that's fine. We've all got our grief. But I'd like to think that there is indeed an archetypal self that, as Annual and and others say, also is a diamond body that is not God, but it sure connects to the divine reality. Uh, that, I think, is a superior alternative to uh, sort of compulsive grief. Thank you very much. For your time.